Welcome to another Encore presentation of Heart to Heart with Anna. Today's show is from Season 3 and was Episode number 9, Forever Young, Dealing with Cognitive Impairments and CHDs. After Nancy Jensen came on Heart to Heart with Anna to talk about school issues, I knew I had to have her back on the show to talk about Jessica and what it was like to raise a child with cognitive impairments. I love Nancy's perspective on living life with Jessica, and I'm sure you'll be inspired by her story. Now, on to our Encore presentation for Heart Month 2016. Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is a program designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the third season of Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Parents who have babies born with complex congenital heart defects face much more than just the grief of losing a perfect child. For parents whose children have to undergo open heart surgery within the first year of life, there are so many uncertainties. Of course, the most immediate concern is whether or not the child will survive the surgery, but once one gets past that, there are so many other things that parents must face. According to an article published in Pediatrics, the most common long-term complication of CHD surgery during infancy is brain injury. The youngest patients are at the greatest risk. These brain injuries sustained early in life have lifelong repercussions. In another article that discusses cognitive function and academic ability, published in 2001 by Hart, Dr. Ray and Dr. Sensky conducted their research on children three and a half years of age and older because the previously published research had contradictory results. Some research indicated that children with cyanotic defects, or heart defects that result in less oxygen in their bloodstream than is optimal, performed better cognitively if they were operated on earlier in life. Some research did not support that hypothesis. It appears that the techniques the researchers have used in the past made the results questionable. Dr. Ray and Dr. Sensky created a research project to test a number of hypotheses. The test looked at children who were healthy compared to children with heart defects, both cyanotic and acyanotic, and children with a completely different chronic illness, children awaiting bone marrow transplantation. They also looked at the age the children were when they had their open heart surgery to see if cognitive outcomes would be better the younger the children were when operated on. Although the researchers admitted that their sample size was small, that some children were lost to follow-up care, and that some children died, they felt the results were sufficient to draw some conclusions. There is good news. Preoperatively, or before the children with congenital heart defects were operated on, they showed only minimal differences from the healthy group of children regarding IQ and school achievement. Additionally, children with acyanotic congenital heart defects actually achieved higher scores and would be expected from the test standardized norms. But that confirmed research that had been reported before. The researchers postulated that this was a reflection that the standardized norms are no longer accurate. But I question their postulate. Could this instead be evidence that children who receive early childhood education are not only able to catch up to their peers, but might even exceed expectations? This is something I wish the doctors had also considered. The doctors felt that this was evidence that parents should be encouraged to treat their children normally and for them to expect normal childhood development. Sadly, the same was not true for the children with cyanotic congenital heart defects or those who awaited bone transplantation. Because these children performed similarly to each other, the doctors posited that, for older children at least, certain types of congenital heart defects have greater impact on cognitive development than others. Their poor performance on the academic test supports the view that schooling is affected despite the IQ being within normal range. These researchers found that the cognitive impairment increased with age. Therefore, the younger children with cyanotic congenital heart defects were less different from their acyanotic peers when they were little. The researchers said there may even be a critical age for corrective surgery of cyanotic congenital heart defects. Otherwise, the consequences of hypoxia or reduced oxygen in the bloodstream will result in even greater cognitive impairment as the child ages. The doctors say that the future looks brighter for children with acyanotic congenital heart defects than in the past. 
However, they also state that children with cyanotic congenital heart defects are more at risk than their peers for cognitive problems and that they may continue to experience such problems long after surgery is conducted. They say that longer-term follow-up is required to determine the extent of cognitive impairment in these children and how best to overcome it. Clearly, our topic today, Forever Young, dealing with cognitive impairments and congenital heart defects is something that needs to be addressed. Today's guest is Heart Mom, Nancy Jensen. Nancy Jensen and her husband Carl have three heart-healthy sons and Jessica, who was born with Tetralogy of Fallot, pulmonary atresia, severe pulmonary artery stenosis, non-confluent pulmonary branches, major aortopulmonary collateral arteries, or MPACAs, and DeGeorge syndrome. Jessica was very blue her whole life. Despite five heart surgeries, she never had a complete repair. Jessica became oxygen dependent about seven years of age and needed a motorized wheelchair at age nine because walking became too difficult for her. Jessica had two strokes, which greatly affected her development. She eventually recovered from most of the physical deficits caused by the strokes, which surprised all of the specialists. Jessica started school at three years of age and remained in special education until she graduated from high school in 2008. Sadly, Jessica passed away on October 4, 2010. Although she wasn't expected to survive childhood due to the severity of her congenital heart defects, she amazed everyone. She was a happy, loving person who survived to be 22 years of age despite all of her medical issues. Many of my longtime listeners may remember Nancy Jensen from Season 2. She was one of my guests in the episode about school issues. So welcome back to Heart to Heart with Anna, Nancy. Well, thank you, Anna. I'm glad to be back. I was amazed with the research that I did, especially since over 20 years ago, it wasn't uncommon with children with complex congenital heart defects to suffer from cognitive impairment. But what surprised me was that it looks like that's still the case. When did you discover that Jessica was cognitively impaired? Well, Jessica was very sick from the get-go. She was in the hospital a lot. She had her first surgery when she was five months old, but every little illness would send her back to the hospital. So we were following very closely, and she had her first stroke when she was five months old with her first heart surgery. And what happened with her was a blood clot broke off in the heart and went to the brain in the speech area. And so it made her right side weak. So she was able to get therapy starting from Mm -hmm. even in the hospital before she went home. So we knew very early on that she was delayed. Mm -hmm. Well, hindsight is 20-20. And looking back now, I'm sure you can see certain signs that let you know that she was cognitively challenged. Obviously, even in the hospital, they knew that she was cognitively challenged. But can you give some parents a better idea of certain signs that they should be looking for to determine whether or not their children need therapy? I mean, clearly with Jessica, because of that stroke at such an early age and because of where the stroke happened, they knew that she would need remediation immediately in order to have a chance to have some kind of normal childhood development, normal for Jessica. So for parents whose children maybe don't have a stroke that early, but who are a little concerned, what kind of signs do you think they should look for? Oh, definitely not reaching the milestone, such as not rolling over at the age they're supposed to or being able to sit up or lots of different milestones. And like with Jessica, she would point at something and kind of grunt. And she had a real hard time forming words. I knew because of the stroke to look for that. I know there are a lot mm-hmm. of children that have a difficult time forming words and different things. And I realized after a short while that she sounded like a young man that I grew up with who had Down syndrome. He wasn't mm-hmm. able to talk, but he would point and make certain noises. And so I brought that up to Jessica's homebound teacher. And we started teaching her sign language. And, of course, with her stroke and being such a young child, she couldn't necessarily sign exactly the way ASL, the American Sign Language. So she had her own Jessica sign. And (laughs) she really, really took off with it. So thankfully the stroke didn't cause problems with her understanding speech, just formulating a word. So she finally could communicate, and she was so much happier. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That makes complete sense. So her gross motor development with her hands and her arms was not affected as much as her speech development. Is that what you're saying? Well, it was affected. 
she wasn't able to sit up until she was about a year old. And mm. part of her problem was that her heart was so weak and she had weak muscle tone. And we couldn't necessarily do exercises a lot with her because of her heart. So they told me that it was pretty common with children with CHD that they were at least somewhat delayed in the beginning part of their lives due to their heart not functioning well enough for them to be able to crawl to right. work on right. right. motor skills. Yeah, mm-hmm. and Jessica did walk until she was two. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I frequently tell parents when they tell me they're concerned about their children's development is I ask them, when did they have their first surgery? How long were they in the hospital? Because you need to subtract those days, in some cases weeks or months, from the child's physical age. And you also need to take into account a normal period of recovery because... When they're getting over having these heart defects, they're not able to process information the way a child who's heart healthy and has never had heart surgery can. And so for Alex, that's what I would do. When I was worried, is he where he should be, I would subtract the time that he was in the hospital. And he had two open heart surgeries in the first year of life, and he had major complications after the second one that dealt with speech, just like Jessica, only in his case, he had paralyzed vocal cords and he had a partially paralyzed diet. Diaphragm. So uh-huh. that definitely interfered with everything. And so I think the parents need to keep in mind when they look at what any of those what to expect books or normal ch- child development books, our children start out minus. <laughs> Because they start out on paralyzing drugs. Yeah, I mean, they're paralyzed, they're sedated, they're pinned down so that they don't pull all their tubes out, and that's just not normal. And children don't just learn from hearing or seeing, they learn from doing. And our kids are restrained from doing very early in life. So I think what you said that was very good. Look at those those little milestones and the big milestones too, but I'd like to caution parents, subtract the time your children were in the hospital plus a normal recovery period. And think about it, a normal adult who goes and has something done, they're usually given a six to eight week recovery period. I think our children deserve the same kind of consideration with their milestones, with the development that they go through. And for a lot of our kids, their development is interrupted. And it sounds like that was definitely the case with Jessica where she had not just one open heart procedure but multiple open heart procedures over the course of her life. Is that true? Absolutely. And as you mentioned, that you need to uh, subtract the amount of time that they're recovering from surgery. Jessica's therapist was very good to remind me about that. And so I didn't yes. stress all this much. Um, Jessica's mm-hmm. would progress. She was below her peers, but mm-hmm. she seemed to progress on her own little scale up until a certain point. And then it seemed mm-hmm. beyond that, she just, for years, was stuck at, like, age seven or eight. And every once in a while, she would come up with something that you would think a much older child would be able to think of. But those moments didn't last very long. She was, mm-hmm. like you said, forever a little girl. Let's do one more question, and then we'll cut to a commercial break. You said that Jessica started school at age three, but you also said she received therapy in the hospital. So was she receiving ongoing therapy even before she entered the early childhood program at age three? Oh, yes. We have different programs here in Arizona. I don't know what other states have, but she was able to have a homebound teacher. She had occupational therapists a physical therapist, and a speech therapist. And they would come in depending on how urgent the need was, sometimes weekly. The homebound teacher came weekly. And in the beginning, the occupational therapist and physical therapist came in weekly as well. So we had those ongoing visits. And then it became more apparent that she needed the speech. Then the Mm -hmm. speech therapist started coming in more. And so we were constantly doing therapy, and I would learn what it was that they wanted me to do so that I could do it with her daily until we saw them again. And there were times you could tell that she was tired, and I could see her heart beat pounding in her neck, and she was getting blue, and I'd have to make them stop and say, that's enough, and you know with her later in the day. 
I kind of just watched her and monitored her with the therapist so that she didn't overdo it, but that she would be able to learn and grow and develop. I mean, you were such an awesome mom. You are such an awesome mom. But, I mean, Jessica was just so lucky to have you. You were right there with her every step of the way. And I just feel like she was such a lucky little girl. Well, at one point, as she was very young, I just realized that if she was going to have any chance at life, it had to be me. There was nobody else able to step up and do what she needed to be done in order to have any chance at a happy life. And I was fortunate enough that my husband was able to work extra jobs so that I could be at home with her and at the hospital with her and therapy with her. Right, right. That love and support, I'm sure, is why she lasted for 22 years instead of succumbing to her heart defect earlier, which is what all of the experts expected. So kudos to you, Nancy. You helped a miracle occur, and I I think that's just amazing. Well, we do need to take a quick commercial break, but don't leave yet. Up next, Nancy is going to tell us about the pros and cons of having a child with a cognitive impairment when we return to Heart to Heart with Anne. Anna Jaworski has written several books to empower the congenital heart defect, or CHD, community. These books can be found at Amazon.com or at her website, www.babyheartspress.com. Her bestseller is The Heart of a Mother, an anthology of stories written by women for women in the CHD community. Anna's other books, My Brother Needs an Operation, The Heart of a Father, and Hypoplastic Left Heart Syndrome, a handbook for parents, will help you understand that you are not alone. Visit babyheartspress.com to find out more. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with heart mom Nancy Jensen, and our show today is Forever Young, dealing with cognitive impairments and congenital heart defects. We just finished talking with how Jessica was born with a complex congenital heart defect and how she suffered a couple of strokes in her early years, which required her to seek early education. So, Nancy, I used to be a special education teacher, and I know it can be hard having to communicate with a child with a cognitive impairment. So you told us that you learned some sign language. You came up with Jessica's signs, which I think is awesome. I know that when I was working with children as a speech therapy student way back when, we also used communication boards. So did you use other forms of communication with Jessica as well? Jessica would have been 26 right now, so that was quite a few years ago. We did not. When she started school, I sent a backpack with a notebook in it. And the teacher and I would write notes to each other every day. And the teacher would write down what she had done and what she had worked on so that I could ask her questions about it at home. And in the beginning, I would watch her for facial expressions and gestures and any way that we could communicate with each other. That's how we did it. It was just such an amazing thing when they first started teacher sign language. She just got so excited that she could communicate. She was almost Mm -hmm. like a hard seller. She was running around, grabbing her toys, wanting to know, what is it called? It was a hot The therapist and I just cried. So I had to learn sign language to figure out what to tell her. If we didn't have a sign for it, she made up her own. (laughs) (laughs) That's just how bright she was and how determined she was to communicate with you. That's just amazing. Yeah, I guess it gave you a new appreciation for what it was like for Helen Keller. Absolutely. What I also did is I would listen to any kind of new sounds that she would make and think of, let's see, what word does that sound like? We are going to learn that word. And we would form those sounds into words, and that also helped her. And another thing Mm -hmm. is that the sign language came so easy for her that the neurologist thought that she would never learn to talk, at least clear enough for people to understand her. Mm -hmm. I saw how she tried to communicate with other people, and they didn't know her sign language. And, mm-hmm. you know, I realized it was very important for her to be able to communicate with others. So what we would do is she would want something. Well, she would have to try to say it before getting it. Mm-hmm. And even if the sound was off, at least she would try and make her try a couple of times. And then we started forming those words, and she was smart. She knew that's not what it sounded like, and she would try over and over and over and over again. It was amazing. And that's how wow. she started to learn to talk. And she got to where she just kept talking. 
<laughs> Sometimes we <laughs> joke and say, why did we teach her to talk? <laughs> but she was pretty amazing. But for other parents that are watching their children and seeing them struggle, just try ways to make games out of it. I tried to make mm-hmm. games out of every little thing, so it wasn't hard work. At times, it felt like it. But a lot of times, it was just playing games and trying to learn Trudy's games, and that really made those times enjoyable, and they're really good memories for me. That's so wonderful. It's like play therapy, which we know is very commonly used with children, and it does help. When I was studying speech pathology, that's what we did with the kids. We played with them, and we made games, and they wanted to take part in the games, and part of the games was requiring them to do some kind of speech activity. And you're right. It can be fun. Blowing bubbles can be fun. All those different things that you do with children normally anyway, but we just had a speech component to it and (laughs) kind of trick them into doing more than what they would do normally and you're right you can have some really fabulous memories from that and I think that's why I chose the title Forever Young because every picture I've seen that you've posted of Jessica she always looks so blissfully happy and so innocent and I think that that's because you did make her life so much fun for her and you did make what could have been drudgery and unpleasant therapy you made it fun instead and I think she responded really really well to that so I think when I was reading about the research and how they said that children with cognitive impairment and brain injury tend to show greater differences later on I think what you've said about Jessica validates that can you talk a little bit more about that sure it was really surprising to all of us that she didn't continue up on that curve that she was below her peers, that, as I said before, she was kind of going up, and then she just kind of stayed there. And at first it concerned me. She didn't seem to notice until she got a little older into middle school and high school, and she saw some of her friends from church that were her same age, and even some of the other special ed kids. They would have boyfriends. They Mm -hmm. would go on dates. They would do all these other things. Some of them even got part-time jobs. And because of a heart defect, she was too ill to do much. In fact, she graduated a year early because she had only been able to go to school maybe twice the whole year because her health was failing and she was going downhill quickly. So it became very apparent to her that other people are moving on with their life. And a little girl will say, I want to get married and not have any idea what is involved in an adult relationship. And that's what she would tell me. Mommy, I want to get married now. And so her friends would get married. And it was really hard. Well, Mommy, how come I can't have a boyfriend? And then I took her to a couple of dances. She was in a motorized wheelchair. She didn't know what to do. And she got very tired very quickly. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was kind of cute. The first dance I took her to, her older brother went, and she went out with a young man out on the dance floor, but she just kind of sat there in her chair, and he was dancing around her a little bit, looking at me like, what? And then she saw her <laughs> brother dancing, and she zoomed right back to me, left the pool guy on the dance floor, and said, Mommy, Jessie's dancing with a girl. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> She was just a little girl, and we did have a lot of fun because she stayed that innocent, loving little girl that there were a lot of times that she felt left behind. And her younger brothers grew up, they were at her level for a while, and then they grew up beyond her, and she didn't understand why they didn't want to be with the little toys with her anymore. Mm-hmm. So there were some difficult times there. To me, I wonder if that wasn't the most difficult part of having a child with a cognitive impairment like that is that she seemed with it enough to know that things weren't staying the same around her, but she felt the same. She felt she wasn't changing. Do you think that was one of the most difficult things that you had to deal with in having a child with a cognitive impairment? Absolutely. Absolutely. And she had depression, and there were times Mm -hmm. that she would just cry, and... She didn't know that she was terminally ill. Every once in a while, she would say something that made me think, well, deep down she knows because Mm -hmm. she would say something like, Mommy, when I'm in heaven, will you think about me? Things like that. Oh, 
But then wow. there were times that, why? And then she would just move on. I mean, it was just part of everyday life. Wow. So, That's a really <laughs> heavy thing for a kid to have to think about or to even wonder about. And yet she was able to kind of put those pieces together that she probably wasn't going to be with you forever. It's like she always knew when she was just a little girl, I mean, physically a little girl, <laughs> my husband built the swing set outside, a fort and dragon swing set. And one time we were outside swinging, and she could swing with her oxygen on for a short period of time. And then when I would say, come on, you're getting blue, we need to go in, we need to rest. And she got out of the swing, and the swing kind of was still swinging. And she goes, Mommy, when I'm in heaven, if you see the swing swinging, it's me, okay? And I oh. said, okay. And then we wow. went inside, and we got out coloring books and things. So wow. it was really She had no bad. idea how profound she was. <laughs> Some of these things to you, I mean. Well. Every once in a while, something like that would just come up, and then yeah. it would be gone. Um, yeah, but enough to make you recognize that it's almost like she was trapped in that body. Yeah. There um, was so much more I, to her that we didn't get to know. Oh, very much so. There were times when she would cry and just really be down about her life and how hard it was. And so I would try to figure out how to cheer her up. And finally, I just said, okay, Jessica, we're going to play a game, and we're going to take turns, and we're going to each say something that we like about you. She's like, what? I want to. <laughs> I'd say, well, I'm going to start. So I, start I, say, I like your beautiful smile. And she'd Aww. go, uh-uh, I don't want to. So then I'd say, and I love your drawing, and that's two. And then three... I love the stories you make up, and then she started to get interested. And then she mm -hmm. would start, and she loved to talk about the stories that she made up. And she kind of lived in a fantasy world in her mind. Mm -hmm. And when we would start talking about that, and when we'd start talking about the people who loved her, she would perk up. And then I had a hard time getting her to calm down to go to sleep because she wanted to still talk to her. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my goodness. So we sit down, I would say, okay, Jessica, we've got to play the game. And we could only do five. <laughs> oh, yeah, you had to limit it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that yeah. is such a wonderful game to play, though. I mean, talk about a way to help somebody see that the glass is half full instead of being half empty. And what a beautiful tribute to the relationship that you had with your daughter that you could see past all the glaring problems that were there and focus on all the things that made her special and that made you happy that you were her mommy. I think that game was inspired. <laughs> yeah, really it did. sounds like it was. <laughs> and I believe I had a lot of inspiration and a lot of divine help throughout the years. I did not do this alone. Right, Definitely. right. I think that's how most of us heart moms feel. We know that we're not in this alone, and I think our children have guardian angels that look over them, and I think we have guardian angels to help us out sometimes, too, and inspire us Absolutely. with different things, different things that we may say that are not what a parent who doesn't have a special child would say. Uh, I hate it that we have to go to another quick commercial break, but we do. But don't leave yet because when we come back, we can hear Nancy's parting words of advice when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. Anna Jaworski has spoken around the world at congenital heart defect events, and she is available as a keynote or guest speaker for your event. Go to hearttoheartwithanna.com to learn more about booking Anna for your event. You can also find out more about the radio program. Keep up to date with CHD resources and information about advocacy groups, as well as read Anna's weekly blog. Anna wants you to stay well-connected and participate in the CHD community. Visit hearttoheartwithanna.com today. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today we are talking with heart mom Nancy Jensen, and our show is entitled Forever Young, Dealing with Cognitive Impairments and Congenital Heart Defects. And I want to thank Nancy for coming on Heart to Heart with Anna again. This topic is so important for us to discuss because so many of our heart warriors suffer from some kind of stroke or cyanosis or cognitive impairment, and as we can see, 
this is an issue that so many of us have to deal with that we need to be open and talk about it because it's through talking about it and sharing with each other that all of us benefit. So I'm happy to see that in the research, some of our kids are doing much better, but I think all of us parents need to push for even more research for these kids with cyanotic heart defects. So Nancy, we're back in the studio together, and the one question I really want you to answer before we have to end the show is, What's your parting words of advice are regarding parents who have children with cognitive development issues? So what are some things that all parents need to know, Nancy? Well, first of all, don't ever, ever give up. If you know your child is having issues and you want evaluations and people aren't getting them done, keep pushing. You have the right to receive these services. And if she had not received the early intervention, if we had not started the speech therapy and the occupational therapy and the physical therapy, she probably never would have learned to talk. She may have never right. learned to walk. And mm-hmm. she just had so much of a happier life. And even though this life is very, very hard, try to appreciate and enjoy all the little things. That's one thing Jessica taught me. She loves little games. She loves joking around. And we made every little moment that we had together fun, even throughout the pain and the difficult times in our life. We just enjoyed every moment. It's worth it. Just don't give up. Keep it up. I think that's excellent advice. And that's a message from Nancy and from her daughter, Jessica. I can't think of a better way to conclude this episode of Heart to Heart with Anna. Thank you for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time for a brand new episode. During the month of February, also known as Heart Month, Heart to Heart with Anna will broadcast a show every day. On Tuesdays, we'll have a brand new show featuring our theme for Season 7, Congenital Heart Defects Around the Globe. The other days will be encore presentations with a brand new intro. If you'd like to know what shows will be featured, you can check out our website at www.hearttoheartwithanna.com. Please find and like us on Facebook. Check out our Café Press Boutique. Revenue from the Café Press Boutique helps to defray the cost of this radio show. Follow our radio show on Blog Talk Radio and especially on Spreaker. Once we get to 100 followers on Spreaker, we can petition iHeartRadio to carry our show. And then people can listen to Heart to Heart with Anna in their cars. Thanks again for listening. We know that congenital heart defects touch people all over the globe. So remember, my friends, you are not alone. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you've been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host, Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time. We'll talk again next week. Thank you.